It's great that you're all here and that we have Jay with us. Um, Jay is the lead storyboard artist for this year's opening film, Isle of Dogs, and, and was on another of one of my favorites from Wes Anderson, Grand Budapest Hotel. And if, if that wasn't enough, he'd also worked with uh, another master, which is uh, Nick Park, uh, yeah. with uh, Wallace and Gromit, with my daughter's favorite, Shaun the Sheep, the movies and the series. He's very popular in Germany, isn't he, Sean, I think? Yeah. He's big. Yeah. The sheep is big. <laughs> um, we'll get into all that. Uh, just the other day, I had a chance to meet with Jay and see a little bit of what he has in store for you. And there's so much great material that I'm just going to limit myself to one question. And then at the end, we'll have a chance for your questions. And also this idea for uh, some live uh, storyboarding. Um, and one little concept that we thought about was that poten potentially you have something in your head, some scene that needs to get figured out, something that might be well communicated uh, by a storyboard. And so Jay might be able to tackle that for you. I so. could make a real mess of it if you... <laughs> it might be, you know, because that is effectively storyboarding, isn't it? It's problem solving and... Uh, so yeah, that sounds fun. So if, yeah, if there's any thoughts out there and uh, we can catch up at the end on it. Yeah, great. Um, so the only, the one question I had, I woke up this morning thinking about the idea of talent and how talent is so intertwined with this idea of drawing that, ah, uh, you know, this person's good at drawing, oh, they're talented. Uh, but it used to be that as children, we were all great at drawing. We loved to draw and we were genius at drawing. Our parents told us that we were great. But at some point, it became about talent. It's a, it's a strange thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I had heard about this study where they took a bunch of fifth graders in, in school, and they separated them into two groups. They were all given a very simple puzzle. Mm -hmm. And then after completing the puzzle, half of the class was praised for being talented. And the other half was praised for being hardworking. And the puzzles kept coming, the puzzles got more complex, and the children who were praised for being talented all of a sudden said, I don't know why I was called talented, but started to freeze up and they started to have problems with their puzzles. And it was the students that had been praised for hard work that were able to excel. Mm -hmm. And I wondered for you early on, when did you, when did this idea come to you that, well, I'm good at drawing, maybe I'm talented at drawing, I don't know how this came to, your original ideas on this, but at what point did being talented at drawing, when was that not enough? When was it about hard work? That's quite an interesting opening question you've got there, Andrew, isn't it? And uh, we could do an hour on this, I think, alone, couldn't we? But um, I think it is what you, what you speak to there is so true, this idea that, um, you know, and, and there's very much in Picasso's thinking, wasn't it, in, in his art form, is that when we're, when we're young and we're, we just, we just go for it, and you just enjoy the process, the act of drawing. And um, at some point, something shifts slightly. And um, but I would, I mean, I definitely have vivid memories of one of you know, like a, a terrible crayon drawing, you know, being framed by my auntie up on the wall. And it, I, 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 I it came to me earlier because uh, I was talking to someone about this, and and I had a flashback, you know, to that little framed picture and everything and I think that's all it takes sometimes isn't it is that your inner voice tells you that I enjoy this a lot you know this is fun but it just takes the outside uh, person just you know that art teacher or you know that filmmaker that you aspire that you get to bump into and he encourages you or something so I think gradually you, you get those little bits of encouragement and you consider about trying to make it a profession and uh, that's when the hard work part comes in because <laughs> you don't have a deadline when you're a four-year-old uh, kid there with your crayons but certainly when you're a storybody you know you, the, the deadline is everything um, because you can't you know it's, it's just about trying to find that fine balance of creating a nice drawing that hopefully inspires and sets the mood but you can't spend all day on it you know um, you can't spend very long in a sequence because the sequence might get cut and then you're in you know, you're in trouble because you've exhausted yourself. So it's, it's a very sort of um, particular kind of drawing is storyboarding. Um, it's a sort of beast to itself. And, 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 and also in the UK, I'm not sure if it's the same in Germany, it's not really taught. 
Um, it's, it's a sort of a, a profession that you kind of have to learn on the job a little bit. Um, so yeah, in answer to your question, that I think that's probably where the hard work part comes in because you're really going to have to sort of um, knuckle down, produce a lot of drawings and, you know, in any art form, whether it's painting or whatever. But I do like that idea that, you know, someone has that initial talent, that initial buzz for it, but over time, they're going to realize, well, I might not be the best, you know, like I can't draw cars, I'll, I'll hold my hand up. It's not that I can't draw them, it's just that I, I don't enjoy drawing them. And so then you've got to sort of trick your brain a little bit. Um, so that's, that's the hard work part of it. And... Um, yeah, I just think that um, uh, that's what I was going to say is that, you know, I might not be the best at drawing cars, but I'll work pretty damn hard at the car I'm drawing. So, yeah. okay. Well, great. Can we, can we jump into the, your presentation, what you have? Yeah. So, I mean, I was going to say also that this is going to be a little bit of showing images and videos and chatting to yourselves. And I'm sure at some point I'll knock over a bottle of water or something like that, but it'll be fine. <laughs> Okay, so I suppose these, I, I've included these images up front just as a, as a preamble really of this whole idea of um, getting into storyboarding. And these are some of the first images that I saw, um, which are the, the storyboards of Jurassic Park, an action sequence. And I, they're at the back of the making of book, you know, which I was obsessed as probably most of you are with making of books. And, um, yeah, it's just that initial thought of, wow, people draw this stuff, you know, and then going to the movies and seeing big T-Rexes and all kinds of crazy things. And um, I've always been intrigued by that initial spark, those initial sketches and ideas, and how that then goes through a very kind of long and sometimes arduous process through many different departments, you know, uh, to the final piece in the cinema, you know, it's, it's always intrigued me. And so, yeah, this is around 1993, of course, every kid's going to do a space invasion movie, and this was mine, so these are some really early storyboards. And when I went to university, I made a few short films, so these, again, are some examples of those. And so leaping forward, I got a position at Ardman in the art department. How did you come into this position at Ardman? I mean, because that is the holy grail of animation. It's a beautiful... Yeah. yeah. It, it was a peculiar thing, because I was, I was literally, I think, waiting for my GCSE results to come through, which I don't know if you know, those are the sort of exams that you sit. And, I, you know, you've sort of, what am I going to do in my life? How am I going to do this? And a little magazine came through the letterbox, and it was an article on Nick Park, you know, and I just read the article. And I remember seeing him with his sketches and with the models, Wallace and Gromit and the rocket. And I just thought, yeah, this, this, is, this is for me. This, this is the kind of thing. And so just like investigators, um, as you do, you know, find out what university you went to, decided to go to that university. And then serendipity in the third year, he, he awarded a, a bursary of 500 pounds. And you had to just put forward an idea, a proposal for a, for a short film. And I won that. I don't know where the 500 pounds went. I don't know if anybody ever sees it. But, um, but luckily made that contact. And then once I was out in the industry and realized how difficult, of course, it is, I just pushed for work experience. And then one thing led to another. So. But it was funny because at the time, there was no real storyboard department. They were using DreamWorks storyboarders. Um, and, and again, this kind of speaks to something that's not really something that was taught in England. So I worked in the art department and I drafted the, the props, like grandfather clocks and whatnot. But I did keep pushing for, you know, storyboarding experience and did a few commercials. And then, you know, was lucky enough to get on the Sean, the Sheep series two, I think. And, and then sort of flash forwarding ahead slightly uh, from the series to the movie, which was fun because it was sort of taking those characters and throwing them into a much more larger world and that sort of thing. So this kind of brings us up primarily to my f first uh, work experience with Wes, really, um, which kind of came off the back of, I think he'd been looking for storyboarders that had animation experience. And I think that's perhaps because there were going to be a lot of models, there were going to be some animation, stop motion animation in the film. 
but um, yeah, I just I, I think perhaps in live action, sometimes storyboarders are more focused on special effects and action sequences. And as those of you who've seen the film, I'm sure you know, there's um, you know very subtle acting going on. And um, so, can you can you tell me about your? Well, it looks like that's what we're getting, but just your very first uh, communications uh, with Wes Anderson when you got brought on board for this. Well, I'd heard, obviously, when I got the gig, I kind of looked into it, and um, I, I'd always loved his work. Since Royal Tenenbaums, I saw at university, so I was you know, very interested. And um, I looked into the... He'd, he'd always be making little sketches on the script in storyboard form, so this is a a scene from Rushmore, which we'll just uh, let play for a few seconds, but you'll see below there are um, thumbnails by Wes and little shot descriptions underneath. So he's, he's mapped out quite a bit of the film? Or, in, or just special sequences, as did it work out that way? That he's for... I'm not sure, actually, at that time. Perhaps he was was doing the whole film or certain bits. Um, but I think that actually looking into it further much, much later on uh, is something that Scorsese does a lot. And this was an article in Time magazine, you know, a couple of months ago about his process. And I think you can see there there's a still from The Silence, maybe one of his last films. And I, it, apparently he just locks himself away in a hotel for like two weeks or something and just, you know, draws the images that come to him from the script and things. Um, and so it's, you know, it's perhaps something that, that Wes picked up on that idea. I know he's a fan of Scorsese films. And yeah, it's just, that, it's just that way of the director having that time to himself to figure out a plan, isn't it? A plan of action. And so when, when Wes, what is your collaboration like when, you know, for starting with um, Grand Budapest Hotel, what, what did he give you? What did he tell you? What was, what were your marching orders? Sure. Well, so on Grand Budapest, there were thumbnails, you know, and there was the script, of course, which was, um, you know, incredibly dense with detail. And it was just about making that merger of the script, you know, the thumbnails, and also just emails and notes that Wes were thinking at the time and kind of merging everything together and starting to draw these storyboards. And of course, then just the back and forth of, you know, maybe not like that, maybe move him to the left, you know, maybe he's not wearing a hat, you know, the usual back and forth that we have as, as storyboarders. Um, so yeah, here are a few examples. You can see the thumbnails, um, a few instances there where you can see the complete shot and everything. And I just kind of went into the process because I've always been a big fan of, you know, illustrators. And this, this is a work by a British illustrator called Edward Borden. And I've always enjoyed, you know, playful drawing, as I said. And um, so I kind of went into it. It's another, he used to do the old um, film posters for um, some great films. So, so these, these were uh, some of your inspirations going into the film? Yes, effectively. Um, uh, you know, I, I wasn't going to sort of draw in a realistic way, you know, because time is of the essence. And um, so that, that's the approach we sort of took. And, and you know, Wes's f thumbnails obviously have a very simple and unique look to them. So it's about trying to not lose that, you know, by, by overcomplicating the drawings. And just, a, just a quick question there, because I think that's one of those, those things where maybe as a director or somebody in the film team, or the writer, or you, you need to communicate something, mm -hmm. you know, so let's say in this case, the director has something they need to communicate and it's just this little chicken scratch drawing of, uh, you know, there's a little circle here and a stick there and you get a sense of what's, what's in the frame. Mm -hmm. uh, how does it work best with you and a director when it, when it comes to what they can bring to the table to just get the process started? What do they bring that's helpful? I mean, of course, I've had all kinds of it experiences either way you know you have it a lot sometimes where a director's happy for you to just you know hit the ground running and start showing him images and he can react to those or she can react to those 
and then you know you have the other side of the coin where people a director sees things in a very particular way and it's your job to you know visualize that and so yeah of course thumbnails are helpful and you know as with anything thumbnails tend to be a, a kickoff point you know that the, the actual hard work is going to come by actually starting to see the detail and you know once you get it into an animatic then that's a whole, whole other ball game because then you're dealing with things over time and um you know, so then you'll get notes about that. You know, the shot's too long, or if there's too many characters in shot. It's confusing. Um, so yeah, I would say thumbnails, especially from a project like this, um, because he has a very particular way of moving the camera, and so what you end up with is kind of like these are like chocolate box, you know, opened up. But th this is the sort of artwork that you supply in order to get the particular camera moves and the you know the way the camera whips from him to the picture and from you know as he slams it down um so this is just a sort of jigsaw piece that you sort of put together and it, you know it's fun again it's it's fun to do um what is, what's interesting about seeing these you know because i have some older ideas of storyboards in my mind where you know you see these, these big swooping arrows come in and tell you exactly what the camera is doing and uh, here there's space, you know, there's, can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, it's, arrows are a funny thing because um, I used to use, use them a lot and then I got kind of, there was this thought process where really if the drawing isn't giving you the sense of the movement, um, then not that you've failed, but that, that, you know, that, that's the challenge is the, the, you know, the, how the characters posed and you know how how you deal with the detail should really somehow like an illustration you know it should jump off the page and you know if you can do that then that's great you know and to not have an arrow or anything like that that's distracting you know you're not going to have an arrow in the final film so it's just about trying to get as close as you can to you know the finished piece um, i mean on, on grand budapest i always kind of thought of it as a sort of illustrated, it's almost like they'd shot the film and then this was a kind of illustrated book version of it or something. So there was a little bit of, of that thinking. So you're imagining it, I mean, it's, it, it, I would love to see this as a, as a book, you know, as, a, yeah, as an illustrated book, it's quite beautiful. So you're seeing it as a, as a film that's already been shot and you're just filling in the frames. Yeah, I wondered if that was, that was just an approach that seemed to fit for, mm. for the project and um, yeah. Uh, so I'm just going to tap through these, these are just, this is not an animatic, this is just real time flicking through JPEGs and this is how I would deliver a scene, obviously from the brief that Wes has given me. And this is how obviously the director will see the images first so he can start to re react, give notes and... Um, So obviously I include the script down the bottom and it's very important to have the dialogue. But I think the, the big learning curve for me on, on something like this project was just how um, useful an animatic can be to get the rhythm of a scene. Mm -hmm. And I think this was one of the early ones where I realized that it's interesting, he's going from a, you know, a two shot of Zero and um, M. Gustav to a wide of all the different characters that are coming to them and then back and forth and how you sort of build up a, each scene really should have its own natural rhythm to it and so this is going from the storyboards the first set of storyboards and then it goes into an animatic yeah so all this once the drawings are approved they are sent to an animatic editor and in this case, on, on both of the um, Wes Anderson projects, it's been a chap called Edward Bursch. And he takes the drawings and puts them into After Effects. And so basically, that starts to enable us to really kind of replicate camera moves. You know, if there's a zoom, then he's able to zoom physically into the drawing. Um, all those characters that you saw moving around, you know, can give that sense of action. And it just, leads to a sort of um, 
a better sense of timing of how long a shot needs to last and, and that sort of thing. Cool. So I can talk a little bit about the animatic part now, if that's okay. So this is a um, this is a, an example of the animatic and everything, and there would be sound and scratch dialogue put to this also. Um, but hopefully, it gives you a sense of you know the actual drawings themselves starting to move and the camera moves and so forth. This is a split screen comparison. Where's the boy with the apple? Gotta go, gotta have a business. I'm gonna blast your candy ass once and for all right now. We'll, we'll move on because <laughs> suddenly it gets very violent. And, uh, but that kind of brings us up to Isle of Dogs, really, so. Okay, well... Which I, I have the crew hoodie for, and I, I kept on, but I'm going to take off now because it's really warm in here. <laughs> but it is the official art department. You know, pretty snazzy, yeah. Not all crew gifts are that smart. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what that says on the back. I don't translate. Okay. So there was a film between, for, between Budapest Hotel, I mean... Fantastic Mr. Fox came out after Budapest. Uh, no, that was before. before I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is his next stop motion feature. Yeah. Uh, what do you know about the lessons learned from Mr. Fox and, and, and what, what did you get from Wes going into this project early on? Well, it's such a beautiful film, isn't it? Fantastic Fox, Fantastic Mr. Fox. And I think it's really one that is just growing over the years and more, more people are appreciating it and the craft and everything. Um, my sense is that this time around, Wes kind of knew what he was getting involved in. You know, he knew the level of detail that he could go into and, uh, you know, none of this stuff exists. It all needs creating, you know. Um, and so I think he was very much more prepared uh, to step into that very involved world of stop motion animation. And um, I think he was just willing to perhaps allow more time on the animatic um, and, and really sort of spend that time initially to to get a good um, plan of war in place and um, so uh, yeah I think he, he kind of um, he knew what he was getting into this time I think so, yeah. so again the same process really getting the script um, reading that starting to see this kind of epic story <laughs> unfold of many, many characters and lots of different locations. And, and how, does, how does the script read? And, and, and how do you decide on the process of what really needs to be drawn out? Well, that's really, um, that's really Wes's call. And the, the approach that he took quite early on was we're just going to work through this thing shot by shot, chronologically. So we literally started of, you know, on the first day on the first shot and last day was pretty much the last sequence and, uh, you know, which was, it was quite a, a fun way of doing it. Also quite daunting, <laughs> you had this big script to get through. But um, yeah, it was, it was a sort of approach of we're not going to kind of move on from a shot until we're fairly happy with the shot. And um, likewise on the sequence, you know, we won't move on to the next sequence until the animatic of the previous sequence is feeling good and stuff like that. So as you start to move through the process, you're in a situation where you're working on new storyboards, new material, but then you're then getting animatics back and you're getting notes on, on that and we haven't quite cracked it and we have to go back. So it's this continuous process then. And were there... Were there influences that, uh, you know, when you, when you think about a Wes Anderson film, you sort of, it, it, what's so interesting is that there's so many familiar things, but what he does so well is bring it into a frame. So what was the, what was the frame that he was going for? Is that something you talked about? Yeah, I think, 
I mean, early on, right from the start, you know, he said this is going to be very sort of uh, early Kurosawa, you know, Akira Kurosawa is going to be a big influence. And so, the, and, and you get that a lot with directors, you know, they've got a thought process and um, especially with films like these where they're very visual. So it, it really is a case of, um, I think early on he said maybe the storyboards could look a little bit Japanese woodblock print, perhaps it wasn't important, but you know, if you could get that sense into it. So yeah, I just went to places like the v &A, the Victoria and Albert, who have a collection, you know, went and looked at this beautiful work and tried to, you know, basically copy, you know, but just try and get that sense of how these characters looked, um, you know, the landscapes and, you know, it's a, it's a very, it's a style that's close to what I like. I like very simple line work and things, so. I mean, it's just gorgeous, isn't it, to, to look at. This is a Hokusai, so. He'd, he'd done a lot of preparation with his production um, uh, designer, Adam Stockhausen, initially gathering a lot of material, a lot of, a lot of artwork like this. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. That's what's so great about this frame, is that you, it, your, your eye naturally moves through it. You know, it, it, show, it, it has a lot, of, a lot going on there, but the movement brings you into a certain point. It's true, isn't it? It's, um, you know, you see the birds up there and everything's kind of sucking your eye down to this whirlpool. And uh, they're also, it's full of action, isn't it? You know, it's, it's, it's got so much drama going on there. And so right from the start, you're starting to think, well, if this is the world we're in, and you're starting to look at connections, because you realize this, this is going to be Kurosawa in Japan, but it's also going to be a Wes Anderson movie, and he has a particular way of um, making movies. So I was drawn to this idea of how you know, things like the Japanese screen, you have that long um, area and you have these camera moves that he's so fond of doing, these, these boom up and down, um, which was quite interesting. Of course, you have these three panels and you've got a sort of effectively a pan left and right. Mm. And so these are some thumbnail examples of a, of a scene from the movie. These are Wes's drawings these there? Are, these are Wes's sketches with, um, with notes. And so, you know, if you've got a very particular camera move, then again, it's like I said about how figuring out has the animatic editor got all the pieces of information that they need. And yeah, so I was struck by that, that comparison with the, with, with the, with the woodblock prints. Um, another example is in Rushmore, he uses a curtain device and quite early on, in the project, we did have this concept of screens and, and things like that, but it actually went away. It's not in the, the final piece. But yeah, as a, as a story body, you're just constantly looking at what, you know, what is the reference material? What is the, um, and what is the style of the director? And how can you merge those two things together? I mean, you're, you're, you're there at the early beginning. So he set aside this process to storyboard, to do the animatics, to really figure out the film beforehand. So you can see how much gets shaped in that, in that time. You know, how many ideas come out, maybe the, how the characters come out. Um, have, you seen, have, you, have you noticed that in, the, in your work? Um, this whole idea of trying things. Yeah. Yeah, 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 definitely. Definitely. That's, um, I mean, there's a lot of the world, I guess, this whole idea of uh, world building, I like guess, this, this idea yeah. that the whole, this is an imagined future of Japan, but mm -hmm. this figuring out process is quite fascinating. Yeah, and it's really, uh, the storyboard really should just be, it could look like this. It's, it's never going to be the finished piece because, like I said, you're going to have all this, you know, these fantastic craftspeople. Um, art department and drafts people and set builders and they're all going to bring their craft to it but really hopefully you, what you want from the storyboard is it, it could look like this this is a, a jumping off point um, and so yeah it's um, I, I mean I can speak to that a little bit shortly because I have some images so but yeah mainly it was who are these characters and realizing that you're going to be dealing with a lot of different characters in the story so we go, you know, those of us that work in animation, this idea of a strong silhouette with a character. So of course, with most of those, you've just got them in, in a second. And so th that was the kind of approach I sort of took early on is at least try and make these dogs look as different to each other as possible so that they had a, 
a strong profile. And, uh, you know, just personally speaking, I have... I, I respond to naivete in um, artwork and, and illustration. And these, uh, I know Wes is a fan of Bill, Bill Melendez's work, who, who did all the Snoopy and Charlie Brown original um, projects, and I love those also. And uh, this is a project by the same director, a 2D Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which I always remember seeing when I was younger. And I don't know, for some reason, I just quite respond to very graphic, bold. Um, designs, so that's just a personal thing, really. I'm king of Narnia. First thing I shall do will be to make some decent roads. I, I just show this clip because it's funny because it, obviously in, in, in film and animation you, you, you think to the Disneys and of course that wonderful craft and, and tradition but you know a lot of the times actually when you're younger you're growing up on Saturday TV you know cartoons and that's a lot of the, the staple of your diet and things like He-Man and Masters of the Universe and you know things like that are always quite I'm always still quite fond of because there's you know it just takes you back to that initial um, spark of why you got in, into the business in the first place. So, um, yeah, I, I'd, I'd heard that, uh, or I'd read that, that this the stop motion that I, I mean is just embedded in my subconscious. You know, the, the Christmas specials in America where Rudolph the red nosed mm -hmm. reindeer is you know walking around. It's just forever burned into my who I am. Yeah. And, and I heard that was one of his. Every Christmas he'd have those. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I heard that was one of his influences for this, that along with Kurosawa. <laughs> mm. Absolutely, with the use of uh, fur and all, all these things like, um, what was it, the Rudolph, uh, the Red Nose Reindeer, wasn't it, that they did? Yeah. So, um, yeah, anyway, so just quit very quickly, we have to get going, we have a lot of storyboards to do, what do these characters look like, don't spend too much time, <laughs> is the brief, in a word. So it's, he would, I would get supplied um, with images this character could look like Tofu Mifuni, is it? Uh, the Kurosawa actor. And so I also became aware of these little Japanese dolls that, you know, existed. And again, you're just trying to fast forward ahead in time that this is going to be a stop motion project. So you can really start to imagine um, these characters as, as little models, really. And these are the, the drawings that you came up with. I mean, there is, a, there is a character designer at some point, right? But this is before yeah. that. Yeah, this is just to get the ball rolling, just so we can start drawing shots. And um, again, not, not that this happened very much, but you, you, you wouldn't want a character designer to spend a long time designing a character and then that character's out of the story and, and stuff. So it's, it's just, let's get the ball rolling. So in Chief's case, you know, I had a fairly good idea of the actor, Brian Cranston, who's going to play, so you try and sort of bring some of that into it. Again, you've got the Japanese wood blocks. Um, you know, I would get images from, from Wes or his production assistants for certain characters. <laughs> Funny little pug. Doesn't he look cute? And, 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 and again, this idea of like thinking, ah, it's so funny, you can, in, in this animated world, you could use actors that are no longer alive, you know? And um, so thinking about Charles Lawton when, when I was drawing Jupiter and stuff like that, because he, the, the, the characters are very kind of wise, you know, wise dog. Um, and then, of course, you know, leaping ahead with all the character design that's then going to go from that and all the process that they go through um, to the finished, you know, cast, which is probably just a small portion, actually. It was probably about the same again. So there's a lot of characters, a lot of people to, to sort of get through and depict, really. I, I included this just because as the process went on, as we got further into it and the whole machine was working, you know, there was a model making department and all this thing. It just struck me, 
I just asked the editor, I said, have the storyboards, are they, are they in the edit? Has it worked? And I got the email back saying, yes, they're in, and puppets are already being made. And it was, you know, it's funny how even in stop motion, such, such a slow process, you know, once that production machine is in place, things can move quite rapidly, quite quickly. The other thing is we, we're going to be using a lot of different um, special effects and different settings and stuff. So I'd always been struck by silent films, how they used to hand tint things, you know, for impact. So that's it's something I've used before in animatics and well, creating moods, you know, we knew we were going to have certain moods and scenes, so uh, a nice orange or a nice blue. And it's just a quick way of doing it, really. So yeah, these, this is some thumbnails and instructions from, from Wes on the opening sequence. And I think you'll see down there, he mentions specific films. So it's a case of, you know, we've got to see these films, look at, you know, uh, things we can get inspired by. Um, so he's got Citizen Kane and we've got, the, the brief for this was very much that kind of very strange atmosphere of, you know, Dutch angles and um, scary audiences. And <laughs> Not that you look scary, but... And then, so going through the storyboard process, the finished piece, the finished shots were then put into these kind of documents and that allows all the crew to start to get together and they can start to figure out all their problems and, right, we need this amount of set and this amount of characters. And mm. So um, that's when it starts to get serious, you know, because there's a lot of money um, at stake. I thought I had a clip here, but yeah. Okay, so again, this is just an animatic. This is an animatic for what, what scene? Uh, this, the shots we just looked at. Okay, yeah. Does it not want to play? Does it want to play? It's shy. Okay, <laughs> that's fine. So, yeah, this is, the, we've got some pre production here that leads us up to a clip of Isle of Dogs. So we can mm -hmm. Okay, great. That, yeah. So this is a script and of the scene, and as you can see, it's quite quite dense. It introduces all the characters, and you know, so you get a very detailed description of each character. And again, some instruction and thumbnail from Wes as a kicking off point. So often there was just shot lists, so it was a case of taking that shot list and just starting to do a rough thumbnail myself, just to present to him to get the ball rolling. And he would, you know, we would go through the process, you know, we'd say, is it a three quarter angle on chief? Or, you know, maybe it's more around the front and below. Um, you know, thinking about these other dogs now, what do they look like? Uh, this is a character called Nutmeg. So this is an exact, it's kind of, you know, character design on the fly. This may be a bit too cute. And so how did, how did that work? You, you <laughs> perfect. How did, so you would you would you'd throw something out at Wes and he'd say uh, a little bit more of how does that work? Yeah, you know, perhaps not necessarily naming names, but you know, just Marlena Dietrich a little bit of that or Lauren Bacall and oh, I mean, Lauren Bacall sounds good. Okay, so try and soften it a little bit. So yeah, just you know, just like that. And what was interesting as well, actually, is reading some of the reviews over the last few days. Um, so, one of the reviewers actually mentioned the whole relationship between Nutmeg and um, Chief as a sort of Bacall, Bogart, you know, interaction and stuff. So I was like, you know, <laughs> these little things somehow find their way into the... Sorry, I'll just take a clip. And, and so... So it's nice to see some of your work that really does make it all the way through, obviously. In the character design, it, it influences quite a bit. And so, where are we now in the... So these are storyboards of um, a clip we can look at, and... So this is a scene, we'll see the clip in a second. So, okay, this is the yeah. initial storyboards. So again, showed you the script, introducing all the different dogs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so this... This is an example of, you know, two drawings there that the After Effects editor is then going to, you know, animate those dogs and create the tension and stuff. It, it really is, you know, the editor is the sort of partner in crime with you because you're kind of trying to all figure this out together. 
What's also so interesting is that each of these dogs has such a distinct character. You know, I mean, when you look at a bunch of dogs, it really... You could lose track of who's who really quickly if you didn't have them so... Yeah, anything that can help sort of avoid confusion in animatic is, is pretty good. So then this is a, you know, taking those images and starting to put it into an animatic and adding atmosphere and sound and music. I don't think I can stomach any more of this garbage. Exactly. Same here. And so hopefully this should be the final piece. Okay. How many have seen, has anybody seen the film? Or it's quite, quite a few. That's interesting. I'll try not to give too much away, really. So uh, it just, you, you mentioned about what is the actual nitty gritty of, of the process. So this is just a few examples to sort of illustrate, you know, the, the, the day to day sort of uh, things I've been involved with. So we get a thumbnail from Wes and then it's starting to construct this shot. Um, you know, maybe it's a bit more like this. Maybe we try this. <laughs> um, the, the, the other complication was that he would be using text, you know, the Japanese text and things and just trying to think that that had to work with the image and not get lost. And so that was an, another factor. Um, yeah, just trying different different variations out, really. Um, you know, if there's a camera move, making sure that you can supply, you know, it's like cutting fabric in a way, you know, have we, have we got enough background here for this camera move? Um, so it's, it's all about thinking about what is in shot, but also simultaneously thinking, you know, in order to get this particular camera move, this is the sort of piece that you need to construct. Um, so there's, there's that, and then there's sort of thinking about the acting part of it, you know, and getting a brief from Wes and reading the script and, you know, just thinking about what are some of the poses and him saying, well, maybe he can, you know, look more nervous here. Maybe he could try scratching his, his neck. And, um, and you just kind of supply, like, you know, a little deli <laughs> of things. Um, maybe he should look away from camera at this point and... Um, I mean, that's a lot of detail for a storyboard. I mean, just to get into this character's emotions, that's, that's really something. I mean, but I guess on something like this, it's, it's saving time, right? This is saving time and money. Yeah, I mean, it, it was, we didn't do it all the time, and they were, you know, because the animators were going to, you know, bring their craft to it and imbue the characters with life. But sometimes there'd be things like that that were emotional, and we just spend some time on, on that to, uh, to get it right. Um, action sequences, of course, are the staple of, you know, storyboarders. It's, are we figuring out where everybody is? Are we clear with the action? We're not going to confuse. Um, you know, if the, if the robot dogs start attacking, thinking about that, and what, are the, what are the different poses that it can strike? And, um, yeah, and in those scenarios, wides are always good. And, you know, Wes is often thinking about that initial image of let's just see where everybody is and, you know, let's just get our bearings type of thing. So it's, it's a good, it's a good uh, discipline, I think, yeah. So of course, I, I mean, I said that Kurosawa was the main influence up front, so I started watching a lot of his films. And you sort of say, I mean, the thing you sort of get from him is this, he's this master choreographer of actors. And I would tend to do, and I would always kind of encourage people is it you know to take you know one of your favorite scenes or something that's always you've always really loved from a film and you know actually deconstructing it and, and you know pause the 
the DVD or something and start to sketch, like break it apart. And it's quite a fun way of getting to the heart of why something intrigues you. And, uh, so, you know, again, it's a time thing. So you don't have very much time to do this, but I did do it a little bit on some Kurosawa projects. Just looked at his choice of framing and Um, but I, you know, I, I, I thought about that clip in relation to the, those of you that saw the trailer at the beginning, the fast cut between all the dog tags. And, mm -hmm. um, it's a very quick introduction to each character. But yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's, you know, you're straight in there. And also there's a tension to that scene as well that's building and stuff. So, um, you know, it's intriguing that you can use the edit process to, to get a, an emotion across in a film, isn't it? Yeah, so, you know, and there's a lot of that in Isle of Dogs, a lot of silhouettes and, you know, seeing the characters small within their kind of environment. And the, even the trash island is nowhere you would want to go on holiday. It's, you know, that, that was the intriguing thing with this project is that you were having to make such a horrible place, you know, somehow be appealing and look nice and atmospheric. And, you know, this is all refuge, really. It's... Um, So I don't know how we're doing for time and everything, because I mean, I can start to sort of, when did you want to do the? Well, I mean, we were in the, we're in the question and answer zone. I think if there are questions that want to be answered, that can start now. And if there, if you need more cool. time, we can and keep if going. If not, I can, I, there's a few last images I want to talk about, so we can do okay. a bit of both. But yeah, if anybody's got any. And we have somebody with a microphone box ready to come around. So why don't you, we have one up here. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you ever get like a task where you have to solve a certain problem. Uh, for example, like how should we shoot in, in shoot this scene in the most exciting way, or how should we do this? And they does that question often comes to you, or is that like more for the animators? So you have a problem with the scene, no one's 100% sure the yeah. best approach. Yeah, exactly. Um, usually that would, if, if the director hasn't figured out a plan or he's opened it, it up, that would probably fall to the script writer, storyboarder, before animation and all that side of things. Um, yeah, that tends to be our stock in trade, is that that's kind of why we're there, otherwise, you know, nobody's going to see this stuff. I mean, you're seeing it today, thankfully. I'm very appreciative. But, you know, this is a means to an end. You know, the, the, the film is the, the important thing. And so that's really what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis is trying to figure out the problems. And, um, you know, we, we're effectively the take one, take two, take three of animation, you know, because you, you can't do that in animation. You've got to get it right first time. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, often the director will... Will know. I mean, Wes knows. You know, this. Th he has a plan. We're moving forward, and then that's not to say as we start to go into it, he is going to then react and to things and oh, actually maybe not, and you know, try it this way. And um, you know, occasionally, we, like you get something, get an opportunity to suggest something, and something might get taken. And so yeah, you're always looking for those opportunities. Um, you want to help solve problems. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I've never seen that before. You, you, you said that the um, st storyboard is not being seen by many people, but in the Grand Budapest Hotel, um, were the, ac the actors also um, uh, able to see the, uh, the, um, the storyboard as well as the script? Because they seem to be doing exactly what you had envisaged in your storyboard, so I was wondering whether they had re read it. I mean, that's a good question. I mean, that's, that's really, the, if you're seeing similarities, that's because, you know, Wes Anderson is the through line, you know, he's, he's the one that had the initial thought and plan and then 
the, the actors are then reacting to the animatic. My understanding is they did watch the animatic. They, they were allowed to. Um, perhaps some did and some didn't. Um, I remember seeing an interview, perhaps it was William Defoe, I think, who played one of the characters, and he, he watched it and appreciated you know, being able to experience this whole thing, you know, watch the film, and then he gets to go live in it, doesn't he? They're the lucky ones, you know. He gets to go wear the costumes and, and actually do these things. Um, and then I think maybe someone like Ray Fiennes, who's a much more classical actor, I think he appreciated that there was a plan and everything, but then he was, you know, just going to do his own thing, and obviously, um, so it's, it's probably a bit of both, really, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Going to get it? Yes. Hi. Uh, just um, so, so I do have two questions actually, but one of them is um, when does the storyboarders work end? Um, I mean, we heard like when you begin. Yeah. Um, when does it end? When does are it you end? there? Yeah. <laughs> are you there till the end uh, of the movie, yeah. or you know? Uh, the old, how, how, how the old rolling it? contract. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's it's always it's a producer's worst nightmare, isn't it? Like, how long are we gonna you know need to storyboard and and so forth? It's a bit of a piece of string, isn't it? You know, it's it's done when it's done effectively. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say I was on Isle of Dogs for about two years. And some of that was working quite long hours and, you know... So, so when, during the animations and stuff, then your work is already done? Um, I think perhaps the, the plan is always, the ideal uh, plan is to have a locked off animatic before you start animation and it very rarely happens. Um, we got quite close with this, you know, we did get quite close, but I think we would, we would certainly into Act 3 and they were starting to ramp up, you know, the model making and all that side of things, and the animators were starting shots and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, so we didn't quite get it locked, but we, we were pretty, pretty close. Okay. Just one more question. Yeah. Uh, so you, I think you do have to speak sort of the same language like the director, right? So to, that you can cope and understand each other really like well. Right? Film language. Film language. Okay. okay, thanks. Yeah, perhaps, yeah. If you can pass the, if you. I'll be really quick because uh, I know I know other people that ask, but um, stepping outside of Wes Anderson because I, I I got the impression that he's quite prescriptive. He's he's the writer director, but do you have a way of working with writers where you? analyze the scripts? Do you, do you break it down by elements and say, okay, so this is the visual metaphor, this, these are the characters, and you make a list of characteristics for, for each character? Do you, do, you, do you have a process of working with a script that way that, that sort of breaks it down element by element? That's a good question, because sometimes you do work on projects and, and, and storyboarders are brought, brought on quite early um, into, you know, like brainstorming sessions, and so you'll you perhaps be in the room with the writer and the director and they're kind of thinking about these, these bigger pictures and stuff and you'll be afforded the opportunity to you know, put your 10 cents in or do a little sketch or something like that. Um, and so that, that's always fun, that's, you know, because that's really early, early things. Um, I mean, if you sort of think of an example, it's tricky, but perhaps if you show the, uh, Shaun the Sheep, the movie, so we, we were invited as storyboarders to, you know, to, to be involved in some writing sessions and, um, and just be drawing in the room while people are talking. You know, it's such a visual medium, isn't it? Especially Sean, there's no dialogue. Um, so I remember there was the sequence where the farmer has left the farm and all the animals are depressed and nobody knows what to do and it's going to rack and ruin. And, you know, I managed to do a little sketch of Timmy, the little tiny baby sheep and he was hugging a pair of wellies and you know then there was maybe a sketch of him in wellies you know like kids always put their parents shoes on and, and things like that and so you're doodling away and the director says ah oh, like this you know we need to get that in there somehow and and I think it is in there somehow I think 
but yeah, you, it's great to have those opportunities. But um, it's and then you'll work on projects where that's not what they're looking for. They you know they just want you to visualise what's on the page and stuff. Is that okay? Yes, that's great. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. We had a question down front, and there's a question on the way down to the front. Okay. Maybe that can get asked in the middle. Uh, thanks for your presentation. I have a question about how do you work with the other storyboarders and how do you devise your work and do you lead them? Do they talk with Wes as well or is it only you talking with them? Um, On a particular project or? So you're, you're a lead storyboard artist for both Grand Budapest and for this. So you have another, you have a team as well. How do you work with them? Um, on. On the ground, so for, for, for Wes's projects on the Grand Budapest, in the beginning there were maybe two or three, and also a, a chap called Christian De Vita who storyboarded on Fantastic Mr. Fox. And then for whatever reason, I think we just, as we moved through the process, it just became myself and, and the animatic editor, like I said, partner in crime. And we just were able to, with Wes, you know, develop a fairly fast process. and. So that was fine. So then, for, you know, on Isle of Dogs, he just wanted to sort of continue that process, really. And the thing about, I've worked on projects where there's, there's bigger teams, and sometimes if everything's going through one director, then you get a bottleneck anyway, you know. So it, um, I think it can work in some instance, instances where you can keep a team of storyboarders, you know, fairly busy. Um, but... You know, if everything's going to come back to one person and their feedback and things, um, I was just able to keep enough ahead of him. You know, there were a couple of fraught moments, you know, where it would have been great to, um, you know, have some other people on it. But, you know, I just, I, I was enjoying the challenge at that time. So we'll just you know, see how it goes. And I managed to get to the finish line okay. So I don't think that answered your question at all, did it? No, I can tell. No, no, it's good. Thank you. Okay. Question down front. Um, I was just kind of wondering, I noticed that you used both um, like drawing and digital drawing. Um, at what sort of stage it crosses over into digital copies and what sort of hardware and software you use? Mm, technical question. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> You're asking the most untechnical storyboard. But... I mean, in terms of the package I use is Photoshop, and so I've tended to, over the years, try to trick my brain into thinking I'm still drawing on paper, and so I work on, you know, digital imagery, but I'll have, you know, there's a paper texture on there, and I'll tend to use brushes that look like ink and pencil and things like that. And, um, so I've, I've always tended to do that anyway, um, but it was particularly good for this project with the whole reference to Japanese woodblock prints and, and things like that. So I, I used a lot of inky brushes and, and so forth. But, you know, it's so liberating working digitally because it's very easy to make changes. Um, whereas before on pencil and paper, it was much more trickier. You know, now you can make one little tweak to a, a shot and you can outlay the whole sequence again and very quickly you know that that can be put into the edit and those changes can be included and things um, and also just in terms of you know framing shots like these they're very deep so all, all this material is on separate layers so it's it's very manipulatable is that a word <laughs> I don't know if it is. Um, so the characters are on their own layers and, um, you know, if I was to open a Photoshop file, it, it, perhaps we can do that later, you'll see I have a very disciplined, I'm as disciplined as I can be, I have folders in the Photoshop, each character has his own folder, he will not go into anybody else's folder, um, and, the, and the, the thing about that is, why you're so particular about it is, that if you do have to make a change quickly, you need to be able to get into the file and get to the detail that you need as quick as possible, really. So, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Naive, a very naive and simple question. Um, can, you I like tell naive. <laughs> can you tell us about films that after you've seen them, after you watch them, you wish you storyboarded them? 
Uh, besides Kurosawa, perhaps? That's such a good yeah. question. Though. I love that question. Because, yeah, essentially, I'd love to work with, you know, I would, I would love to have worked with uh, Hitchcock or, you know, something like that, because he was such an appreciator of designing a film. And so, yeah, you get the sense that, you know, something like the Grand Budapest, which was kind of riffing off that whole Hitchcock um, atmosphere. Um, and so, that, so that's cool. Yeah, Kurosawa would be great to work with. So these are good opportunities. To, <laughs> to, I'm not sure what projects I'm going to work on next, but, um, you know, it's always good if there's a, there's a certain, you know, director and style that you can start to think about and, and reference and things. But uh, yeah, there's so many directors I'd love to work with. Yeah. Thanks. There was a question right back here. Yeah, center. First off, thank you so much. Um, I'm a director and I do my oh, own storyboards, so this has just been incredibly informative. Um, my question you, you is- You do storyboards, you said? Yes, uh-huh. Oh, cool. And um, my question is in regards to where your work falls in terms of the casting process, because I saw it was wonderful how the dog and Brian Cranston seem so wonderfully linked, but does it ever happen that you make sketches and those inform casting decisions, or is it always the casting comes first and then your character work is based on specific actors? Mm, that's interesting, because I, I would, I mean, certainly in Wes's case, he's assembling the crew, uh, the cast very, very early on and has an idea of who he's using. So I can't imagine it impacts there. Um, you know, there was a few instances in this project where I'd drawn a certain character and then they'd been cast and so I did go back and just amend slightly um, but that's part of because the character design had evolved and you know um, but yeah I think the, I'm sure there must have been projects I've worked on in the past where um, a storyboard image has perhaps made the, act, the director think of a, an actor perhaps and just yeah. thank you don't forget, he can draw your storyboards if you want that. He's got a wake-up tablet up here. If you want to pass it over to the back corner here. Uh, your question made me think of a, a quick question, but yeah, if we can pass it to the back corner. Um, in the case of Grand Budapest Hotel, you have these actors that are in there, but I noticed that you weren't trying, you weren't, were you trying to draw Ray Fiennes? And, 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 and is that... You know, when you have a cast in place, what, what are the pitfalls or tricks, or should you be drawing the cast? I mean, I think I didn't try, I sort of tried to draw Ray Fiennes as, as if he was, you know, in this illustrated book, you know, version. And Wes had done these thumbnails, and so there, you know, there was already a simplicity to the character design, which I just kind of riffed off. Um, but yeah, that, that for me is more interesting. I love caricature and all those, those great um, Al Hirschfeld um, caricatures that he would do of actors. I, I love all that kind of thing. And so that's why this, this was kind of fun of think, you know, drawing these dogs, but thinking about who they would replicate. I think on some projects it can go too far, perhaps. You know, um, it's just about a fine balance, isn't it? You want to, you do want to create a character. You don't want to be looking at the cartoon character and thinking, "Oh, that's X, Y, Z," or that sort of thing, because it takes you out of the story a little bit. But, uh... um, yeah, I was wondering because you only meant to mention the director that you work with, but um, I was wondering if you also work with the cinematographer. Where are you? Oh, I'm right here. Sorry. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I was wondering if you also work with a cinematographer, because sometimes they have a certain style as well. Yeah. And uh, now you only talk about Wes Anderson uh, as the director, but yeah, can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, certainly um, Wes has a relationship with his DP, um, and they've worked together on a lot of films. And in this particular case, because it's an animation, he worked with another cinematographer that specializes in stop motion animation. Um, so I, I'm not really involved in those conversations, but I have worked on projects. I'm working on a film at the moment where the DP is very much involved with the director and the storyboarder, and that's great. So that's, a, you know, that's another experience. And uh, it's, the, it's the guy that shot um, Pan's Labyrinth, I think. I forget his name off the top of my head. 
But um, so, yeah, you're interested to see his process and, and what he's looking for out of the storyboard. Yeah, it's good. Thank you. Uh, down front here. Uh, just uh, down front on your same. Uh, I was wondering about the set when you're drawing. Do you know the set already then, or is that developed while you're drawing? Is it like, for example, this picture here? Do you know it was gonna be a shed or stuff like that? Or is that something you just drew drawing? Yeah, I mean, just just start drawing and you've got the script description and you've got you know, the, any thumbnails from Wes and he briefs, you know, he says it's a rackety old falling apart. It's, the, it's something that the dogs have created. So immediately you, you start drawing, it's not gonna be a very polished thing. So re really it's just, it's not so much set design, it's just quickly get something on paper that's helping the story, you know, and make sense, you know. Uh, so hopefully this looks like something some dogs could make. Um, and that's really all you want. And then it'd be interesting, you know, to see what the finished shot is, look, you know, looks like, because that's then going to have gone through with the production designer and the and the the uh, model makers and things. So I'm, I'm always interested to see what they did with it and how they hopefully made it better. Yeah. Uh, down front here on the other side. Nice. Good catch. Nice. <laughs> As you like to play around and can draw and can draw on stage, I was wondering if you could draw us Wes Anderson how he would look like when he would be a dog in Isle of Dog or yourself <laughs> or if you did that. Well, I could I could cheat actually because he is a dog. He is in there. I won't tell you which one. Ah. Um, it's about secrets and revealing secrets. True. True. Um, yeah, perhaps when we go into yeah, the live yeah. draw. Yeah, yeah, sure. And if there's another question out there, we can already pass the, the box up. Just hold out. Um, hi. Oh, just hold on that. We're going to... Right. Well, I guess we could probably ask that question in the meantime. Can you, can you draw and answer questions at the same time? I'll try. <laughs> I am a man. I can't really do two things at once, <laughs> but I'll try. <laughs> Does someone have a question in the audience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. go ahead. So yeah, go for it. First, I just wanted to say thank you for the wonderful talk. And uh, a little closer. I can't quite hear up here. Yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. And I was wondering, uh, do you work on a sequence of uh, different pictures, or you work only on one? Uh, and maybe if you could tell us a little bit about the feedback process, back and forth, and maybe how long does it take you for for one picture? Time wise. Thanks. Um, so the question is how long does it take to draw uh, like a sequence, like a full sequence? And do you, do, you work on, do you work on one picture or you work on sets of five, for example, a sequence of five? Um, I'm not sure. A sequence of shots? Yeah, right. Yeah. So or 10? Yeah, I mean, it just really depends on how long. Uh, what's needed in the in the scene? A lot of Wes's work, um, you know, on this project is that you're going to have a sequence that's made up of a lot of shots, and of, it's very complicated, and a lot of cutting around, and then you might have a sequence that just plays out all in one shot. Um, now, which is the easiest? I'm not sure because if you have one shot, then that means there's going to be a lot of characters coming in and things going on in the background, things going on in the foreground. Um, so no, in answer to your question, it's, it's really just what, whatever needs to be drawn is how long it's gonna, you're going to need to spend on it, really. Right. So. Okay, thanks. Wow, that looks a lot like him already. <laughs> <laughs> uh, may I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I want to ask you uh, about the influence of uh, Japanese culture, but, uh, like uh, uh, Japanese TV shows, uh, manga, and anime. Uh, what inspired Wes Anderson on this film? 
Sorry, what was the last part? <laughs> yes, um, uh, I want to ask you about uh, Japanese culture, like TV shows and uh, anime and manga. What inspired uh, Wes Anderson on this film? Yeah, I mean, he, he's spoken a little bit about Miyazaki and, um, and those beautiful films. And um, I think he's made a specific reference about how the Japanese animations are, you know, they, they certainly put an influence on, you know, the environment and the landscape and the atmosphere that perhaps, you know, American films, you know, are not as interested in that. They're more character story based. Um, so yeah, I mean that's that's the only thing that comes to mind for me, other than the fact that you you, know, you try and bring a little bit of the manga language into the drawings and, and things. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. This is the toughest deadline. Yeah. <laughs> okay, keep it together. Jay. Okay, gotta get the hair in there. Yeah, so. Okay, I would say something like that, but uh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure I'm gonna get. Uh, I guess we're, we're just about out of time. I had one, just one last final thought I wanted to ask you about is that for a director, a cinematographer, a writer, anybody who's here who is making films, which is, I guess there's a few, um, what do you say to the person who says, but I can't draw? I hear that expression. <laughs> um, just do it. Just do it, just go for it. Just do it, just go for it. Thank you, Jay, thank you all. Thank you, cheers, Andrew, thank you.